It's the year 2000, I'm 11 years old, and I'm attending a Red Baron's baseball game with my grandparents and some other family members. I don't care about baseball, but my grandpa has indoor club seats, so I'm feeling pretty content just eating soft pretzels and drinking Sprite. I strike up a conversation about computer games with my slightly older cousin when he hits me with, Wait, you haven't played Counter-Strike? You need to play Counter-Strike. Though Counter-Strike would eventually go on to exist in a standalone format, at this point you needed Half-Life to play the game. That same week, my cousin burned me a copy of Half-Life and passed along his actual CD key for the game. I'm pretty sure this meant that he could no longer actually play Counter-Strike Online because I was now hogging his CD key. Whoops, sorry bud. I was somewhat familiar with Half-Life as a game already, but I found the idea that people unrelated to the original experience created a whole new game that you could just download for free if you owned the original to be so enticing. I installed Counter-Strike on the old E-Machines PC and went on to play the game for years, learning all kinds of new words and phrases, making new friends, and seeing parts of the human body for the first time. I loved Counter-Strike, but my main takeaway from all of this was a newfound love and interest for Half-Life mods and, really, modding in general. I'd end up following sites like Planet Half-Life, which would lead me to finding other great mods over the next few years, like the classic horror-themed They Hunger trilogy, or the way-ahead-of-its-time sci-fi action strategy hybrid Natural Selection. Another big one for me was the bullet-time-blasting, kung-fu-fighting, matrix-lobby-scening The Specialist. This project was heavily inspired by Noah Caldwell Gervais' video, Custom Game, revisiting the single-player mods of Half-Life 1. I really love it, and I've revisited it many times over the years. It's become something of a comfort video for me. I saw a comment on my most recent rewatch of it that really resonated with me. I keep coming back to this video over half a decade later. There's something that I find deeply compelling about Gold Source mods. And yeah, they're right. There really is just something about Half-Life 1 and its Gold Source engine. As I write this, today is the 25th anniversary of Half-Life, a fact that somehow hadn't even crossed my mind when I started this project up a couple months ago. In celebration, Valve has released a major update to the game, with new maps, updated graphic settings, and full Steam Deck support. We are so back. <laughs> Beautiful. So, with spirits higher than ever amongst the Half-Life fanbase, I want to talk about a bunch of single-player Half-Life mods. Some good, some not as good, some legitimately incredible. In the hopes of doing my part in keeping people interested in this classic game and its talented scene of creators. Let's get a good baseline and start things off by looking at a very traditional Half-Life experience. Half-Life Field Intensity, released just last year in February 2022, but at first glance I think it'd be easy to assume it was quite a bit older than that. In fact, until sitting down to write this script, I'd just assumed this had been released something like a decade ago. My instincts were somewhat correct, as the developer Hazard team had been working on this mod for 13 years prior to release. I don't mean to say it feels old in any kind of derogatory way though. I honestly love when mods feel like a time capsule of their development period. Like this Flappy Bird joke was clearly thrown in back in 2013, and good on them for sticking to their guns. Field Intensity follows Stefan Oldfield and his squad of soldiers in the Hazardous Environment Combat Unit, the US military organization that you fight against in the original Half-Life campaign, and that you also play as in the Gearbox developed expansion Opposing Force as they attempt to sweep the Black Mesa facility for a cover-up operation. Hi, what part of the armed forces are you with? Really, Field Intensity feels more like an unofficial spin-off of, or maybe even do-over of, Opposing Force. The mod features more or less the same kit as that expansion, with Gordon Freeman's more makeshift arsenal from the base campaign being traded in for military weaponry and, later, a wide spread of oopy-doopy alien weaponry, including the Slurpy Barnacle Grappler Boy. Oh, hello. Who are you? I don't know if this is a hot take, but I think this inventory is a little bloated. 
Despite how powerful some of this stuff is, I'd often just forget it exists at all. Between that and the chore of just keeping all of this junk reloaded, I rarely felt compelled to switch away from the shotgun or assault rifle. There's a section about halfway through where they take all of your weapons away, and I think it would have been fun if they only gave you the alien weapons for a while, but you're back to the full bloat before long. Field intensity also keeps things pretty faithful to opposing force in the visuals department. You'll traverse mostly the same sorts of locations as you did in the official games, and though these locations are, admittedly, getting a bit stale after some 20 plus years, the level design does seem to benefit from examining what came before and understanding what worked and what didn't in those official releases. I appreciated that we kept ending up in the more office-y spaces even towards the conclusion. These mundane places were always my favorite, they're just so appealing in this engine. The mod does implement some more modern touches, like an objective screen with hints and even some short thoughts from Stefan. Custom voice lines are frequent here, and they're done well enough for the most part. These pipes pose no danger to my suit. I just hope nothing bad happens to me until we meet again. It is pretty funny hearing the soldiers go from gruff, grizzled action man to young nerdy guy and back again. Man, my dogs are barking! At your command! Shit, the power is off in this area. There should be two generators somewhere. I hate power generators. It may have been beneficial to re-record some of these lines from Opposing Force with their new actors, but for me, it does kind of add to the homemade charm. Stefan, where the hell have you been? The brass has ordered us to pull out. We must head to the evac center. I will not fail you, sir. There's also subtitles for the vast majority of dialogue in the game, which seems to be pretty rare for a Half-Life mod, and while this is a nice accessibility feature for them to implement, it also smooths over potential audibility issues that can arise with amateur voice acting. My suit is designed to protect against high radiation levels. Don't open the gates for you. Field intensity also utilizes the follow and wait command system from the official games, but your opportunities to use it are much more plentiful, and later in the game, you'll be given some pretty large squads that give the combat sequences a thematically appropriate warlike feel. Though, uh, your small army of dudes can sometimes make things feel a little crowded. No, don't go that way. My god, what are you doing? Field Intensity mostly presents its story in a similar way to the Valve and Gearbox developed entries, with a couple exceptions. In addition to text-based tidbits delivered via your journal, you'll be in regular contact with... Guess who's your radio operator, Stefan? Yeah, it's me. Your old friend Kevin. We'll be there to provide direction and commentary on the mission at hand. Everyone's talking about this Gordon Freeman guy. Looks like he's responsible for this mess. Kevin's dialogue can get a bit silly at times. Nothing can prepare you for what's happening here. Here, death itself assumes shapes unseen before. But I do appreciate the earnestness with which your friendship is depicted. I wish we could reunite, but I'm sort of cut off right now. We'll talk again later, buddy. Kevin's inclusion pays off somewhat in a twist near the end, but I think it's a little bit clumsy. You find Kevin's body, and it turns out he'd already been dead for quite some time, meaning much of his interactions with you were just imagined by Stefan. Hey Stefan, it's me, Kevin. Here I am on the ground, lying motionless, breathless, lifeless. I know it's hard to comprehend, but it's the truth. You'll have to accept it. I actually played this mod twice for this video, and the first time through, I didn't see this journal entry so I interpreted his fate as being a bit more open-ended, in a way that I found more satisfying. Maybe he was communicating from beyond the grave, through some zen alternate dimensional shenanigans? Nah, Stefan just imagined it. Anyways, take these keys. Okay. This thing is also quite long, clocking in at around 5 hours for me to complete. Now, I know for some people this is a good thing, but five hours with mostly the same locations, enemies, weapons, and gameplay that I've already worked through many times over the last couple decades is kind of a big ask, at least for me personally. It just uh, overstays its welcome a little, you know? I don't think I can last much longer. Field Intensity has a very positive reputation amongst Half-Life fans, even winning 7th place in the Player's Choice category for Mod of the Year 2022 on ModDB. Don't get me wrong, I certainly think it's well made, but it just didn't do much for me by the end. A lot of people consider it to be better than Opposing Force, and yeah, I'd say I do agree with that assessment. It's a solid enough execution of an unofficial expansion, 
However, outside of the memorable twist at the very end, it basically washed right over me. Unfortunately for me, Experiment, another 2022 mod, didn't wash over me so much as it drowned me very, very slowly. Unlike Field Intensity, which used Valve and Gearbox's original assets to create a new but faithful to Half-Life experience, Experiment, Cronenbergly stylized like this, is a sci-fi horror-themed total conversion. If you're unfamiliar with the term, a total conversion mod is one that ditches all, or nearly all, assets from its source game in favor of wholly original ones. To Experiment's credit, these assets all look and sound great, at least at first. Experiment takes place, I think, on a space station of some kind, and has a pretty cool System Shock-like atmosphere. This was actually the first mod that I played for this project, and it was easy to be impressed by the high-res texture work and moody lighting. Experiment actually brought home an award from ModDB for Mod of the Year as well, Best Graphical Overhaul in the Editor's Choice category, and I think it's pretty well earned as it often looks, at least from a technical standpoint, more advanced than many of its peers. There's some fun enemy design here too. These obnoxious bugs feel satisfyingly different from the poorly disguised headcrabs of so many other mods. I like that the zombie scientists talk like Kenny from South Park for some reason. Oh god, oh god, Wait, 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 you have And the later evolved form of them is suitably gruesome in its texturing. The arsenal of weaponry here is pretty distinct, at least visually, from Half-Life's as well. As is tradition, your first weapon is makeshift and acquired from the environment, this time in the form of a pipe removed from a vent. There's pistol, better pistol, rifle that's basically the one from Alien, shotgun, better shotgun, you know the drill. Unfortunately, however, though most of these models look nice and are fun enough to use, others aren't so great. These shotguns in particular feel straight up unfinished, they're pretty odd. This is just the beginning of the issues though, as in spite of first impressions, this mod has some major problems. For me, the biggest issue is one best explained using a term coined by a friend of mine while we watched the 2002 Ryuhei Kitamura film Alive. Now listen, I'll defend Godzilla Final Wars any day, and Versus kinda slaps. But Alive is painfully boring in a very specific way. The entire movie takes place in a few nearly identical rooms, with like four colors total across the entire film. The term he came up with, setting fatigue, is the feeling you get when a piece of media exhausts you with a flat, drab, repetitive setting. I've found that this term is just as useful when discussing video games, and I gotta say, this mod truly gave me some of the worst setting fatigue I've ever experienced. The entire thing, from start to finish, is corridor after corridor of these torturously flat and indistinct walls, ceilings, and floors. Even the stairs are flat. Every single hall and room completely blur together before long, and playing for any decent stretch of time honestly gave me a thick, brain fogulous headache. I can't take much more of this. There's no story to speak of here, which isn't a problem inherently, but this means you don't have any context for any of these stainless steel labyrinths to help differentiate anything in your mind. The vast majority of the environments are nearly empty and featureless, save for the occasional crate or piece of debris. So after suffocating in these cramped, featureless halls for the first 30 minutes, encountering this little corner with a couple of tables and chairs felt like a nuclear blast of fresh air. This small crumb of environmental decor was the first time I ever considered that actual humans might live or work here. Well, I think it's rather stimulating, don't you? There's no map either, so getting lost is a constant struggle. I would often find myself playing a game of wall or door, where I would just press E on every vertical surface because even discerning a door from a wall became challenging at times. Speaking of challenging, this is also by far the most frustratingly difficult mod that I played for this video. As I mentioned, I played this one first and I started to wonder if I was just bad at the game, but I can safely say, after playing almost 30 mods for this project, Experiment is just wildly inconsistent with its difficulty. Towards the end of the mod, you start encountering these yellow-suited scientists, basically the soldier analogs for this game. These guys will absolutely evaporate you in just a few hits, it can get excruciating. Also, gotta love these psychic freaks who just deal blanket area damage within a certain range, whether you're behind cover or not. 
These obnoxious enemies combined with the dull, sparse environments just makes for encounters that aren't enjoyable, or scary for that matter. Experiment also requires, at least for me, the most bizarrely challenging crouch jump in any of these mods. I had to look up a Let's Play video to see whether it was intended or even possible to land this jump. Ah! No! 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 Let's try this. No! I don't think I can last much longer. No! Fat lot of good that PhD does me now, hmm? I understand crouch jumping is a staple of gold source mods, and I really don't have anything against it in theory, but it's just so out of place here. I think it might be acceptable if this was a skill that it had you improve upon throughout the game, but this isn't the case, so it just feels kind of mean to expect you to have your crouch jumping skills at an Olympic level for this one singular jump. All of this comes together in an experience that is truly oppressive, in a way that I don't think anything else I've ever played is. When I think back to playing experiments, it's just this vague feeling of being hopelessly trapped and lost within these contextless metal interiors, all of it set to this particular piece of music from the mod that my brain has now associated with all feelings of anxiety or stress. I'll admit I'm tempted to be annoying and pretentious and say that this is all by design, slotting experiment in neatly with masochistic masterpieces like Fear and Hunger and Pathologic, but I won't do that. I do feel bad being so down on this mod though because while it did frustrate me frequently, I really think that there are pieces of a good game in here. As much as the hyper-accurate soldier scientist insta-melting me could piss me off, there was, occasionally, something compelling to quick-saving and loading my way through them, trying to find the perfect steps and shots to take to get past them. Experiment is frustrating in large part because it is so close to being enjoyable, it just feels like it needed a couple shifts and priorities to get there. I think cutting down on the runtime and focusing on a smaller amount of more distinct environments could have made for a nice little sci-fi horror experience. That all being said, for me at least, part of what makes these projects so enjoyable is seeing what an individual or small team can create within Gold Source's restrictions, warts and all. I think if you're someone who is open to something a bit rough around the edges, Experiment is at least worth a try. Delta Particles, formerly known as Half-Life Delta, however, is very easy to recommend. Delta Particles is another mod that retraces the steps of vanilla Half-Life, but does so with a far different stylistic approach. The titular Delta base is much darker, much more industrial than Black Mesa was. It almost feels like Black Mesa's more cramped, lesser-funded little sibling. In turn, most mechanics have been slowed down a little. Your walk speed is lower, your weapons generally fire and reload more slowly, even switching weapons takes just a little bit longer than the original Half-Life. This all makes for encounters that feel quite different, with a larger focus on taking careful aim and being smart with the game's reduced ammo pool. You're more vulnerable in general here, in a way that connects nicely with the mod's thematic elements. Half-Life's often wide open, brightly lit daytime spaces have been replaced with more condensed, more dreary ones. I like these gray, cloudy skies, bringing in more rain as the game progresses. I like the gray cliffs, the gray walls, the gray floor, the gray vents, the gray pipes, the gray guns, the gray soldiers, the gray scientists, the gray zombies, the gray barneys, the gray aliens. Just kidding, that's something else for a future video. It's a lot of gray. I think it really works though, in part because Delta Particles also trains in Half-Life's old, tired orange accents for newer, cooler purple ones. The purple HEV suit, the purple UI, the purple lady, it all looks great. These differences in visual theming, together with a moody, dark synth soundtrack, create a wholly distinct vibe and identity that just really worked for me. The level design is great here too. Progression through the facility feels natural and well-paced. There's a lot of find this keycard or password to open this door segments, but they're done in that good Resident Evil way where when you find a key, your first thought is almost always, oh shit, I know just where to take this. Getting lost is admittedly a pretty common problem for me in games, 
Here though, I almost always had at least some idea of what I should be doing at any given time, and that's with plenty of optional offshoots and nooks and crannies to scope out. I particularly loved this vertically layered office building about halfway through the mod. When you first enter, the power is out, so you have to make your way to the basement to get the power back on which in turn gives you access to the elevator to scour the remaining floors for goodies, but also draws the attention of the soldiers on the upper floors. The whole thing is dynamic and well thought out. It's great. Also memorable is this sequence late in the game where you have to traverse a lower section of the facility that's been flooded completely. The environmental puzzle here of opening up the sewer grate to swim out isn't exactly groundbreaking, but the presentation and progression are so natural and considered that it leaves a great impression. There's not a whole lot of story here, but in that good Half-Life way, where your gameplay is the story. Though you're playing as engineer Nick Farrell rather than Gordon Freeman, everything takes place concurrently with the Black Mesa incident, and so the game follows more or less the same plot beats as Half-Life. You're running late on your tram ride into work, where you put on your special little suit to perform some kind of arcane task, coincidentally perhaps at the same moment as Gordon performs his own, that, naturally, opens up a portal to another dimension, and some unforeseen consequences unfold. Aliens show up, you meet up with the security guards, escort scientists, fight the military, typical Half-Life stuff. One notable difference in this department is Diana, who acts, kind of, as this mod's take on a character like Alex Vance from Half-Life 2, as she'll help you out occasionally and drop some story beats here and there. I actually laughed when I first saw her, because her professional, but nerdy, but cute, mid-2000s core aesthetic really sticks out amongst this cast of Half-Life dudes but even more generic. It definitely comes across a little bit, say hello to your future girlfriend, my gamer. But I actually really liked her inclusion by the end. I loved this moment later on where, after battling some aliens and being wounded, she goes to put on her own HEV suit and does this fucking magical girl spin. It's just such a cute and expressive touch of animation. It's good. After donning the HEV suit, Diana sends you off into the ubiquitous Zen segment of the game. I feel like the discourse amongst Half-Life heads surrounding Zen is something that's constantly shifting over the years. I think we're in a Zen is good actually phase currently, and for me personally, I've never had much of a problem with it. From what I've seen, a lot of the negative opinions around Zen tend to be tied up in this idea that platforming has no place in first-person games, but I have never really agreed with that sentiment. Platforming in Half-Life is a skill that can be tested within a level's design, and just like any other mechanic in the game, there are fun and not-so-fun ways to go about this. Half-Life's movement physics are interesting enough that people have made entire game types based around them. Surf levels gained popularity in the original Counter-Strike and continue to be popular today. There's a Half-Life 2 mod called Creed's Climbing that I used to spend hours with, and I don't think it's a stretch to draw a line from these types of games to more recent ones like Bet and Brutal, or even streamer bait stuff like Only Up. Worry not though, if you're not a Chad Average FPS platforming enjoyer, Delta Particle's platforming demands are on the lighter side. I really liked this take on the Alien homeworld. It too has its own unique feel to it, with this massively high-res skybox giving it some great isolated, lost-in-the-void kind of vibes. Towards the end, you'll have to get this teleporter up and running so that you can return home, which requires traversing through these moon base looking prefab structures and labs. The fact that Delta Base had already set up shop and been working here for some time already is a neat story detail in these structures freshen up an environment that has grown a bit stale over the years. There's no final boss fight here either, which is a smart move IMHO. Through playing all of these mods, one thing that seems consistently difficult to get right is boss fights. Most of them are just copy and paste fights straight from the official releases. If they aren't, they tend to be ambitious but buggy messes. Delta Particles foregoes either of these options and instead has a final wave-based encounter while you wait for the teleporter to fully power up. Not exactly an especially original sequence, but one that does provide a suitably tense finale. You teleport away as the credits roll, but there's one final scene. Diana runs up and hugs you as you both teleport away again to safety. It's just so goddamn cute, and it's such a sweet, slightly silly little moment at the end of a mostly pretty serious and emotionless affair, it was genuinely disarming. It may seem small, but it's so fun to see what these artists decide to put their energy into, 
which in this case is ending their first person shooter with a smile and a hug. There's a moment, about 11 minutes into the extensive intro sequence of The Gate, where it proclaims itself as one of the last Half-Life mods. I laughed out loud when I read this for a few reasons. First, this mod was released in 2006, so this is obviously absurdly untrue. It also feels comically narcissistic. Like, we've done everything there is to do, pack it up, Half-Life modding has peaked. Here's the thing though, the gate is nothing if not ambitious. <laughs> Say hi to hell for me, Adolf. There's things that Half-Life does well and things that it doesn't. I think generally speaking and barring some outliers, working within a similar gameplay and storytelling mold to the original game tends to produce the best results. The gate is not concerned with adhering to these kinds of constraints. We've got actual, mostly functional stealth sequences and a Donkey Kong Country-ass minecart ride in the same mod. It's not concerned with typical narrative constraints either, with a throw it at the wall and see what sticks approach that serves up a sloppy chowder of Indiana Jones, Medal of Honor, and Stargate. Copyright constraints? Never heard of her! The gate's music is essentially just the entirety of the score to Indiana Jones. It just credits John Williams as the composer as if he just walked in fresh off of Star Wars Episode 3 to score a Half-Life mod under the table. The gate opens with a cutscene involving Nazis in World War II, finding a star I mean, non-specific science fiction portal gate buried inside an Egyptian pyramid. We then jump forward 61 years to Denver, Colorado, where our mega cool guy protagonist John is awoken from his cozy winter slumber by a helicopter landing outside his window. I have to say, I actually really love the look of this particular era of Half-Life modding. All of these blocky, simplistic objects, shaped vaguely like what they're meant to represent, textured with just a flat photo of their real-life analog, some objects are just a flat 2D photo. It's a charming aesthetic. Like, look at this living room, these chairs, this sound system, look at this fucking computer. Couldn't or didn't have time to get a nice round mouse here, so here's this thing. Fascinating. I never suspected such things could be. But it's fine. You know what this is. It's cute. So, John heads outside where military colonel man here explains that he's been voluntold to complete one last secret mission. I'm finished, Colonel. You know this. No more missions. What I can divulge is this. It will be unlike any other mission on which you have ever served before. President Bush himself has asked for John personally. President Bush has asked for you personally. Because he's the best there is. You were and are the best there is. He's tops in his squad. You were tops in your squad? He's the best there is. He's asked for the best we have. And you are it. Do I have a choice? No, John, you don't. Sorry. Get your gear. This is going to be a busy day. John is then whisked away to an Air Force base in Nevada, and in one of the few segments that still feels like Half-Life, we proceed through an underground structure full of scientists and security guards going about their business. I've done these goofy retinal scans and these mods so many times. This one actually jump scared me when it blasted my monitor with this 900 times zoom low res eyeball JPEG. Some stern soldier boys allow us into the briefing room where we get our mission details from the general. A chain smoking woman in a skin tight red dress who I guess is struggling with an ill-fitting bra because she keeps doing this. This conversation here was where it really hit me that The Gate is probably the closest thing I've seen to a Neil Breen film in video game form. It deserves to be destroyed by the truth. The strange repetition of phrases and dialogue, the constant assertions that our protagonist is just the bestest, most coolest, most strongest guy around. You were and are the best there is. He's asked for the best we have. And you are it. You are the best we have. If anyone can do it, you can. I've been awarded every medal. The Medal of Honor. The Medal for Meritorious Service. Defense Meritorious Service. Joint Service Achievement Award. Armed Forces Medal. Purple Heart. Heroic. It all comes across a bit wish fulfillmenty or self inserty in a way that makes Breen or other low budget cult filmmakers work interesting and amusing. This is the kind of thing that I think makes Half Life 1 mods really special. Hey. I'm a 2003 guy. From what I understand through putting this video together, Half-Life 2's source engine, while powerful and versatile, has a level of complexity that makes creating a total conversion on the level of the gate a much larger undertaking. 
There's a sequel to the gate for Half-Life 2, and while I haven't played it, it's immediately clear, even just skimming through gameplay footage on YouTube, that it seems to reuse far more assets from the base game than the first mod does. The visual and technical fidelity of Half-Life 1's gold source exists at a sweet spot where a single person or a small team can feasibly create something wholly new and uncompromising, which aside from allowing for genuine high-quality art, also leaves room for earnest but flawed attempts that fall into the quote-unquote so bad it's good pool of something like Breen's fateful findings. After some more insistence from the general that we really are George Bush's favorite secret agent, John, President Bush has asked personally for you on this one. And an admittedly cute nod to a classic Half-Life line. They're waiting for you in the gate chamber, John. I think I'll need more than luck this time. Catch you on the flip side. We head through the gate and are transported back in time and across the globe to the pyramid from the intro. This early section is pretty fun, despite some kinda janky traversal and half-baked puzzles. The combat and gunplay have a sort of PS1-era Medal of Honor feel to them. It's challenging, but not brutally so, especially with liberal use of quick saving and loading. We release a prisoner Stinking Nazis. I hate them. who agrees to show us the way to a German tank base, which begins a lengthy stealth sequence, something which was thought impossible with the Half-Life engine. I was honestly dreading this portion of the game, as stealth can often be pretty unfun, even in games that are built with it in mind. The player is tasked with making their way around the perimeter of the base, avoiding soldiers and dogs along the way. Being spotted or trying to simply snipe guards from their towers will set off an alarm which triggers a game over. Surprisingly though, this was far less painful than I expected. Even the second half of the segment where you have to manually order the prisoner around in such a way that he isn't spotted is relatively forgiving. Before we can complete our mission though, John is beaten unconscious by Anna here, and we're rewarded with another conversation scene. And you are? Anna. Anna Kessler. Are you a secret agent? You're close. You, you look weird. Talk. Who are you? My name is John Collins. I was born and raised on a small plantation in southern Missouri. I'm a United States Special Ops soldier. I've served in Grenada with the Navy SEALs, and I served in Panama with a crack Delta Force regiment. That has been sent through a time gate to your time to stop the Nazis acquiring knowledge of a time gate they discovered this year in this place. Huh? Told you you wouldn't believe me. The Germans must be looking for the skulls and the second gate. There have been rumors that the Germans have found some kind of ancient time gate. They have. I came through there to get here. We escape through a hatch in the floor and descend into the mod's obligatory sewer portion, solve some obligatory wonky physics puzzles. Do you still say there's nothing to chaos theory? And flip some switches for the obligatory get the power turned back on for contrived reasons sequence before getting whisper beckoned into a closet. with the legendary Agent X. Huh? You're Agent X? Wow! Who John promptly threatens to kill for no real reason. For this, my friend, I will give you some very interesting information that will help you with your search. How about I just blow your fucking head off right now? Agent X drops us off for a little sniping mission, which is simple enough as the enemy AI can't really seem to deal with us attacking from any remotely lengthy distance. More importantly though, he's also our ride to the aforementioned minecart ride, which like in Donkey Kong Country, will probably kill you quite frequently. I actually got myself into some trouble here when I quick saved after failing to shoot this track changer, meaning I had to start the whole mine segment over again. But I did it. For you. Unfortunately, this was just the beginning of my technical woes, because after John and Anna are kidnapped and thrown in jail, the game would just give up and kick me back to the main menu upon loading the preceding level. I actually gave up here originally and decided that I'd probably seen enough to be able to discuss this mod for the video. But after sitting down to write the script and watching back some of the footage, I felt like I owed it to you to see how the end of the gate plays out. A lot of older games like Quake for example will have their source code released publicly and in turn fans will develop what are called source ports, which are basically versions of the software modified to run on different systems or in different ways than the original software would allow. This is how you get, like, Doom running on your pregnancy test or whatever. Half-Life is not open source, but through some hard work, and maybe at some point in time, possibly some leaked code, it's not quite clear, modders have put together Zash 3D, which is the closest thing Half-Life has to a source port. Zash allows you to run Half-Life and its mods with better compatibility than the Steam version, 
which is cool, because a lot of these old mods have, understandably, not been updated to work with modern versions of Half-Life. If you are looking to play older mods like this, Zash is a super valuable resource. Alright, so, let's load it up in Zash, and hey, look at that! My save loaded, and after leaving John to rot in save file jail for two real-world months, we are out. Well, technically we're not out just yet. You actually do have to spend five actual minutes just sitting in here twiddling your thumbs before the guards complain about how stinky you are and take you out. I can respect games doing stuff like this, like that shower scene from My Work Is Not Yet Done we discussed a few weeks ago, or the latter sequence in Metal Gear Solid 3, but this is obviously just silly and doesn't add anything of value to the experience. From this point on, the gate dials back on a lot of the location shifting stuff, and we spend the majority of the remaining runtime in Castle Wolfenstein-ish territory, which would be fine, but this portion of the game also starts to go hard on the obtuse bullshit as well. Like, I have to get a key to this door, but after searching around for quite a while, I gave up and looked up a playthrough, something I'd be doing frequently from here on out, and it turns out the key is just under this seemingly random man's dead body. I guess you just have to hope you've been chopping every single body in the game to bits like a sadistic freak and stumble across it. It's fine though, they're Nazis. Or take this section, where a machine gunner will blow you to bits if you dare show him so much as a single pixel of your body for a single frame. I saved right next to this wall, determined to load death after death until I hit him before he hit me. Did I do it? Holy shit, I did it. He's gone. Now I can just... Oh. Yeah, it still shoots you even if the operator's dead. You're actually meant to slowly push and hide behind this barrel instead. Alright. We jump down in a sewer-dwelling man Don't shoot, follow me. escorts us back to Anna, whose microphone quality has taken an unfortunate turn for the worse. Hello, John. It was you, so. The Germans tried a little too hard to extract information from us about the gate. How did you escape? I thought they killed you. An American secret agent called Brother Six had to escape. He arranged a truck, the clothes, oh, in the oh, oh. of French border. He arranged everything for us. Jesus, this is like mid-2000s child and online game has meltdown level of audio clipping. You said you give me whatever I wanted to give me. I said I'm not giving Now I want chocolate milk. She tells us, I think, I mean, listen to this shit. To you was Abby in repeated speed and now share you with base to accompany her out to sea. That they've got the gate loaded onto a massive boat and that Hitler himself is on board. Another thing, John. Hitler himself is said to be on board the ship. Hitler? Hitler himself was said to have visited the site himself. Hitler? Oh, and she also asked John to sleep with her because of course she does. Okay, great. And now where do I sleep tonight? You want to know where you sleep tonight? I hope me. Uh, okay. I hoped you would say that. Here you are, John. Go through the hatch, and you should be in the u complex. Thanks for last night, Anna. It was beautiful. John, I will never forget you. Nor me, Anna. Okay. Ah, immediately stuck again. Hmm, maybe destroy this electrical panel? Maybe the door here. Or this one? Shoot the lock? Wrong, you idiot. You have to destroy this single panel of chain link that looks just like these other ones, but is for some reason destructible and climb on in. A panel with a number pad? Hmm, better hope you know your numbers in German well enough to see this note and put zwei and zwei together. The best part is when you get to this sub that you're meant to blow up and you realize, hey, they never gave me any explosives. Well, guess what? That room you unlocked ages ago with supplies in it also held a bomb inside a crate that can be broken apart but that looks exactly like 500 other crates in the game that can't be broken apart. So we backtrack all the way there.
There's enough explosives here to sink 10 U-boats. And then all the way back to the sub. After blowing up the sub, There's enough explosives here to sink 10 U-boats. Agent X picks us up to show for us to the Bismarck, our final destination. Holy fuck! Look at the size of that thing! Yes, Germany's finest and biggest. Good luck, Agent, and may God save the Queen. It's your Queen, not mine, buddy. Yeah, your Queen, not mine, buddy. We get on the boat, kill Hitler. <laughs> Say hi to hell for me, Adolf. Set the whole thing to blow, and then jump in the gate. The Bismarck sinks and we jump forward 18 months. It's a late night back in modern day Denver, and John's evening ritual of reading PC gaming magazines and listening to Shakira by the fire is rudely interrupted by a knock at the door. It's Anna. Wow, a happy ending. Fade to black and roll credits. Oh hey, in loving memory, that's nice. Who are we memorializing here? Oh. Oh, oh dear. Two brave soldiers who fought for two great nations? Yeah, our brave grandpas. One who fought Nazis and one who was one. Well, that's the gate, everyone. So, we're a little over halfway through the video at this point, and I'd like to shake things up a bit. Change up the pace a little, you know? I played a lot of mods for this video, and there's quite a few that, while I didn't feel compelled to write about at length, are still interesting enough to warrant a mention. There's a neat little mod that I used to play around with a lot called Counter Life, which replaces the health and HEV stations in Half-Life with the vendors that sell weapons and equipment from Counter-Strike instead. The weapons are quite overpowered and trivialize much of the experience, but if you have any nostalgia for old school CS, it's a pretty amusing way to replay the original game. If you are looking for a more balanced campaign revisit, M-Mod is definitely one of the best ways to do so. There's a huge list of features and changes. From small touches like being able to see your own body, improve particle effects, and more NPC variety, Okay, I'll wait here and help anyone else who comes by. To the completely game-changing overhaul of combat, weapons feel much more dynamic and have new features like the silencer for the pistol and SMG, or the sniper mode for the revolver. Even the crowbar gets some love, with a satisfying new alternate fire that hits hard but is slow to recover. They also managed to make the SMG actually feel good to use, while still keeping it faithful to the original. A minor miracle, if you ask me. We've played a security guard, we've played a soldier, why not a headcrab? Half-Life Zombie Edition lets you assume the role of one of the iconic and adorable cranial crustaceans, granting you the powers of be small and jump high. As you might expect, coupling with a human mutates you into a full-size zombie, making you slower but also equipping you with a powerful scrape attack. I really wanted to love Zombie Edition, but sadly, some elements of its design didn't really gel with me. I softlocked myself multiple times by decoupling from my human when I wasn't meant to, and many encounters boil down to awkwardly throwing myself at enemies and hoping for the best. Cool idea, though. That'll look nice in my trophy room. Crack Life refers to itself as, quote, a oh dear. unfunny, racist, offensive mod featuring a bunch of overused jokes and memes that only get more annoying every time you hear them. And uh, yeah, I'd say this is a pretty accurate self-assessment. Crack Life is essentially vanilla Half-Life with a bunch of memes and juvenile humor tossed in. Hound Eyes have Dr. Bennett's face and scream at you. The health stations scream at you. The Pink Panther screams at you. There's just a lot of audio abuse in this thing. This type of mod seems to show up for just about any game where it's possible to, especially older games, so as much as this is not for me, I felt compelled to try it to be as thorough as possible. I will say, for as much as this mod touts the we're so offensive angle, it's relatively tame. It's more 9gag than 4chan, if you know what I mean. Heck, I'd say Postal 2 is more offensive than this, and that was a game with a physical release you could walk in and buy from CompUSA. How interesting. Just look at that. There were a couple bits that got a chuckle out of me. The HEV suit alerts are narrated by everyone's favorite nostalgic malware Bonzi buddy. The more we grow, search, and travel in Black Mesa together, the smarter I'll become, unlike you. This bit about pansexual Gordon Freeman using neo-pronouns and having a PPHD in theoretical genders 
doesn't really feel mean-spirited and is so stupid that it swung back around to being funny for me. I got deeply into RuneScape earlier this year, so I was kinda delighted by the inclusion of a Monkey Madness side quest, complete with a Rune Simi at the end. This all being said, it is a truly obnoxious mod, and you probably shouldn't bother with it. If you are looking for a more humorous mod, I'd recommend checking out Hazardous Course. Yeah. This is kind of like the I Wanna Be The Guy or Kaizo Mario of Half-Life, regularly killing you in unfair and trollish but funny ways. I couldn't make it super far into this one before it surpassed my skill level, but I could definitely see certain types of players having a great time with it. <laughs> Gunman Chronicles began life as a Quake mod, later moving over to Half-Life before eventually being given funds and resources by Half-Life's then-publisher Sierra to become a full standalone release. Valve and Sierra have all but abandoned the game and, ironically, the best way to play it now is through a community developed mod called Gunman Chronicles Steam Version. This strange Ouroboros nature of mod to game to mod is evident even without the development backstory. Gunman definitely still feels like a Half-Life mod, just one with a big enough budget to hide that fact a little better than the amateur projects. There's a lot of interesting ideas at play here. Most weapons have a full-ass list of firing modes making for a unique, if perhaps overly complicated, arsenal. There's been a few mods over the years with vehicles. Even Counter-Strike tried it out for a while. But Gunman easily has the best I've seen in Gold Source, with a tank that's genuinely pretty fun to use. I remember reading about this game in gaming magazines as a kid, and being blown away by the dinosaurs and animals that roam around, and honestly, they're still kinda cool to see. I considered giving Gunman Chronicles its own section, but given its weird in-between state of existence, I decided against it. Also, to be honest, it's like 8 hours long, and I just didn't feel like it. But I would say that from what I did play, it's interesting enough to check out, and I may go back to it someday. Half-Rats, the mod, developed by Half-Rats, the person, puts the player in the shoes of the titular Half-Rats, the character, on the night of July 14th, 1883, when an ordinary evening in his apartment above the general store is interrupted by a full-scale monster invasion. Oh, Afrats is a mod that goes harder than maybe any other I've played at just being itself. It wears its creator's influences and hobbies on its sleeve in a way that's hard not to find at least a little endearing, despite the fact that I really couldn't be less interested in these subjects myself. I get the sense that Afrats is like a Civil War cosplayer guy who wanted to sprinkle some of that essence into every element of this experience. There's a truly multimedia feel to Afrats. Photos within the game world are, I assume, of him and his friends in costume. Music in the game was performed by his band. There's a ton of voiceover here as well, with writing that's quite indulgent in its old timeyisms and theatrical delivery. Extraordinary circumstances call for extraordinary introductions. And it's a pity the only one there to take my calling card was uh, subject to harsh criticism on the part of his dismal playing. You get the sense that everyone involved had a lot of fun making it, and at about an hour and a half of playtime, I found it enjoyable enough to see through to the end. It's got a sequel, Half Rats Parasomnia, but it was too hard and I gave up pretty early on. I'm sorry. To close out our shorter segments, I'd like to talk about Half-Life Caged. Created by an ex-Valve employee and released in 2017, Caged is a short but sweet mod that I had a great time with. No long preamble or exposition dumping here. You're just an unnamed prisoner, serving time for an unknown crime, starting your escape attempt with nothing but some crates and a plunger. I like how the scientists in the cell reuse some of their voice lines from the base game, but in a new context. My god, what are you doing? I certainly hope you know what you're doing. Certainly easier than writing and recording new dialogue, but more importantly, it's funny. That sound, what is it? Oh no. Oh dear! The environments here look great. You can tell this was made post Half-Life 2 in a few ways, but especially in the visuals department. There's some neat lighting and high-res texture work without being overly flashy. The prison cell areas are grimy and industrial, but not overly dark like a lot of these mods can be, while the guard housing areas are a bit more clean and high-tech. Caged also has a relatively subtle synthwave thing going on, using music by Laserhawk playing on little radios throughout the prison to punctuate key moments. 
Caged only lasts about 40 minutes, but it does have some secrets to find if you decide to go back for another run. This is also a mod that you can just download and play on Steam, as long as you own Half-Life, so if you just want to check out a more recent mod with a small time commitment, I'd say this is a solid pick. Though, if you haven't played in a while, I might recommend playing on easy, as it can be pretty punishing at times. I'm not sure if this is something that has come across on this channel quite yet, but I'm a huge freak for horror games, and really just horror media in general. And I love that Half-Life has always been willing to play around in that genre. Half-Life 1 had its moments. Playing through this section at a young age definitely got to me a bit. Half-Life 2 bumped it up even more, of course, with Ravenholm. The horror sections in Half-Life Alex were more effective for me than any of the full-on horror games I've played in VR. So when I started playing mods for this video, I was a little disappointed to find that there aren't a ton of standout spooky offerings. Obviously, Cry of Fear is the big one. Playing that when it first came out was kind of a revelation. It's a bit janky, and the writing is a bit silly and edgy, but it's honestly one of my favorite horror games, and the fact that it's a Gold Source mod just makes what it's doing all the more impressive. But in the time since its release, Cry of Fear has gained a ton of popularity and been covered to death at this point. I'd personally recommend checking out Pim's Crypt's video. They have a much more in-depth and nuanced take on it than you'd find here anyway. So instead, I actually want to talk about Mistake, a lesser known and flawed but still interesting horror mod. Mistake begins with the player waking up in a dark hospital room and features 15 to 20 freaking minutes in the horroristic Andrew Parker Asylum. With little to no story, this is very much a haunted house type of experience. You'll progress through the asylum in a mostly linear fashion, where occasionally a nondescript meat boy or some other spooky visual will jump out at you, before disappearing or teleporting you away. The environments look decent, and there's some cute touches here and there. Finding these contemporary movie posters all over is pretty funny, as if the creators just wanted to let us know what movies they enjoyed. Like, what other game are you going to find with a reference to the 2006 horror masterpiece, Stay Alive? Let's go around the mausoleum here. Nice. And eat this. Come on! Sweet Jesus, these dead bitches are coming out in droves! Miller, that's in the back reach up right in front of you! There's little in the way of actual danger here. The majority of Mistake is played without any combat, only giving you a knife about halfway through, no guns to be found. But, like a haunted house, I think what I like about it is the scrappiness and homemade feel of it. Okay, yeah, Steve here in his blue sweater and mask made of deli meat isn't fooling anyone, but I feel like some of its visuals, like these scenes of indistinct blob bodies in rooms covered in comical amounts of blood, work because of their amateurishness, rather than in spite of it. There's a scene in the infamous 1992 shot-on-video German horror film, The Burning Moon, in which a character goes to hell, and the depiction of hell is so over the top and very clearly just some guy swishing meat around, that it circles back around to being kind of effective and memorable. Or take Halloween Party, a homemade short horror film made by some teenagers in 1989. It's a cute little Halloween video for the most part, a fun one to put on at your own Halloween party, but some of this shit out of context is pretty horrifying. I think a big part of why these visuals are effective is that there's an inherent allure to shot on video media within the horror genre. It can give this sense that, because video is a physical media format, one that an average person could have access to, there's a possibility that you're watching something that should never have been made. Something forbidden. Something that someone dug up or found stashed away somewhere, and you're now complicit in what it's depicting by viewing it. There's a trend right now, and for the last few years, in indie horror games in particular, to use the aesthetic of VHS and home video to enhance the fear factor of their games, but I think it's a little bit misguided. These aesthetics don't convey a sense of the forbidden to a game in the way that they do with a movie, because low-budget or homemade games never actually looked like this. It's why I think playing in the aesthetic of early internet or early amateur game production works so much better. It's why creepypasta can be such effective horror, or why RPG Maker games can often be so much scarier than big-budget horror games trying to emulate movies. The excellent MyHouse.wad from earlier this year works as well as it does, in large part because of the presentation. It's totally feasible that a seemingly innocuous Doom mod you stumbled across on a forum is somehow cursed. It's totally feasible that this random, forgotten Half-Life mod from 2007 might not be totally above board, might take you further than you bargained for. I don't mean to overstate anything here. Mistake is just a little linear sequence of scares, 
Nothing groundbreaking or exceptionally memorable. I do think it's telling though that even here in 2023, you can browse the horror section of itch.io and find plenty of games following a very similar formula to this game. I just think that there's still value to mods like Mistake, and experiences like myhouse.wad prove that there's still untapped potential within these old game engines. There is a sequel, prequel, to Mistake called Mistake Minus One, and it's alright. It's probably technically better, it looks more advanced, some of the monster designs are pretty fun, but it just feels more like any other horror game of the time. It doubles down on the tired mental asylum trope and has a lot more story elements at play. Also, for some reason, they made the already bad Half-Life flashlight even worse. So most of the footage I have to show you is just a black screen with a teeny tiny pinhole of a viewable environment. Is someone there? I, I can't see a thing. It's not a bad horror mod. I just don't have a lot to say about it specifically. If you're hungry for some gold source horror, and you've already played the big ones, Mistake and Minus One are worth checking out. Something I do have a lot to say about, however, is 2018's Half-Life Echoes. I'm just gonna say right here that this is probably my favorite mod that I played for this video. It's the one that, if you haven't played Half-Life for a while, and you want to see what people have been cooking up in more recent years, this is the one you should play. Echoes is yet another mod that seeks to retell the story of the Black Mesa incident from a new perspective, with mechanics that fall roughly in line with what you'd see within the base game and its official expansions. The incredible thing about Echoes, though, is just how much detail and reverence for the source material it manages to pack into its three hours-ish runtime, without losing its own voice or becoming overly referential. I can't take much more of this. <coughs> One of the most memorable parts of the original Half-Life was the time the player would spend in the facility before the Resonance Cascade. Being able to explore the facility, watching guards, scientists, and other workers go about their day, getting into cutely mundane shenanigans like the infamous microwave incident. My god, what are you doing? These scenes were novel for the time, but even today, they still do a great job at humanizing and grounding the world, and selling the facility itself as a real place where people live and work. Echoes begins in much the same way, with our unnamed player character, referred to only as Candidate 12, beginning a seemingly normal day of work in the Black Mesa Research Facility. 12's exact position of employment in the facility is never actually stated, but it seems fair to assume their job title is something far more pedestrian than our favorite cart-pushing theoretical physicist Gordon Freeman. No fancy tram ride intro or HEV suit for us, just underground parking and hoofing it through the basement. From the minute you gain control of 12, Echoes demonstrates absolute mastery of the Just Another Day scenes that Valve does so well. I truly do not think I could overstate just how cleverly crafted these scripted sequences are, and the fact that they're all made exclusively with repurposed voice lines from the official games just makes it all the more impressive. A lot of good that PhD does me now, hmm? You know, theoretically, this is impossible. Theoretically. I'm gonna apologize in advance for how much I'm going to gush about this element of the mod, but it seriously just goes so hard with the quantity and quality of these scenes. Damnation! Someone will pay for this mess. I promise you, when this is over, heads will roll. Take this moment that occurs like 30 seconds into the mod. I don't think this is anything technically more advanced than anything we saw in the base game, but just this little detail of a confused guard rushing out to shut off his car alarm has more personality than some entire mods I've played. You have any idea what's going on? As good as these moments are, the developers weren't content with just creating scenes for you to passively observe. Echoes consistently rewards you for being attentive and curious and interacting with its world. I first experienced this while ascending some stairs towards the surface level of the facility. An electrical worker doing some repairs above this questionable scaffolding caught my eye. Call of the Void kicked in and I jumped out onto it while the worker begged me not to. No! Stay back! Plummeting to my death after the board broke from under me. <laughs> you even get some special death screen text making fun of you for your poor judgment. Oh, hey, some boxes. I wonder what's in here. Are you insane? Don't be a fool! No. Hey, wait a sec. Is that a guy up there? I can definitely get up there, right? 
Yeah, you totally can. And there's just this drunk dude up here mumbling on the floor. It's so good. At this point, I just started doing weird shit just to see what the game would acknowledge, and it paid off every single time. Let me just jump into this water fountain real quick. I believe this will make for a notable paper, don't you? Okay, how about this one? What are you trying to do? If you're waiting for the tram to Sector G, then you're probably better off walking it. I overheard someone say that all the trams Whoa! are- Are you insane? Are you crazy? It's so clear that Echo's creators vividly understood how Half-Life players engage with these games. Ah, hello, Gordon Freeman. It's good to see you. I don't think so. Big day today, Freeman. Please. Freeman? I really don't know. Potty humor delivered by the protagonists of the co-op-only PlayStation 2 exclusive campaign Half-Life Decay? Uh, I'm stuck. It's so goddamn stupid, I love it. Excuse me! Hey, watch it! This is by far the funniest Half-Life mod there is, and it's taking every ounce of self-control I have not to put in clips of every funny moment in this thing. such things could be. It's not all fun in games, though. Just before we can proceed with our iconic tram ride, the Resonance Cascade kicks off properly, and the facility descends into full alien invasion meltdown mode. As we're dragged to safety by our colleagues, the mod makes a shift into survival horror territory. Echoes is more than happy to leave you powerless for a good bit longer, asking you to maneuver your way through the now dimly lit maintenance areas of Black Mesa, crawling with monsters but with no means to defend yourself. There's a great sense of place here, too. Remember these guys? Now we're on the other side of this forklift accident, only able to progress because of the crate left behind by their earlier mishap. Much of our way forward is signposted by environmental lighting, and while it might be a bit heavy-handed with it at times, I love how dedicated the mod is to maintaining an internal logic behind almost every instance of it. Flashlights shining the way to progress also tell the story of a guard killed by a zombie. Trails of glow sticks light the way forward for you, but always serve the additional purpose of detailing the path of another character who met an unfortunate fate in their own escape attempt. In a lot of games, I'll get this anxiety where I want to explore, but I'm not sure which route will lead to progress and which will lead to extra stuff, so I just have to guess and hope I don't block myself off from anything. The fact that the route to progression is regularly so clear also has the nice side effect of reducing that anxiety, making me feel more free to explore, but in a more immersive way than using a map or markers on the screen. Exploration is totally worth it too, not only offering the standard health and ammo pickups, but occasionally providing little story bits and access to certain weapons earlier than the main path. This sense of ludonarrative harmony extends even to the otherwise standardly half life and physics puzzles. In this sequence we need to gain access to the other side of this broken bridge. We've seen these explosive boxes before, so we already have a pretty good idea of how to get started here. We push it into the flowing water and break some boards to allow it to float its way out to the grinder. I absolutely love how our colleagues watch us do this from the other bridge, running to the opposite side of the window to watch the chaos unfold. One light goes off after the first explosion, indicating that we need two more to complete the puzzle. Our colleagues yell down to us, beckoning us to climb up, cheering us on and directing us to another explosive box behind us. Finally, we remember that we used one of these boxes to reach the bridge entrance in the first place, so we use an elevator to bring that one back up and out into the water. I can't explain just how refreshing this simple box pushing puzzle was after so many instances of having to look up how to progress past inscrutable nonsense like this or this. The finale of this horror-themed opening has us getting knocked out by a zombie losing access to our only recently acquired crowbar. Even worse, we're now being hunted by this thing. This is actually a cut monster that was planned for the original Half-Life, known as Mr. Friendly. 
His attacks apparently would have consisted of spurs, vomit, and fatal copulation. After a pretty legitimately scary chase scene, we finally catch up with one of the guards from earlier, now fatally wounded, who offers us his pistol. Look, I'm chewed up pretty bad and I got my legs broken. I'm never gonna make it. Hey, try not to get eaten by a monster or anything, okay? Combat in Echoes takes that familiar but tweaked approach that we've already seen in a few other mods in this video. The weapons use the updated models from Blue Shift, and if you haven't played in a while, you probably won't even notice any changes. If you have played a lot though, the small changes to sounds, damage values, clip sizes, etc. actually do make a beneficial difference in how the game feels to play. After narrowly avoiding being flattened by a gargantua, we find ourselves in a nearly demolished train loading station. A security guard calls down to us using the iconic Black Mesa text-to-speech announcement system. Hello there, amigo. Up to your of control room. Quick, Mr. Head down to the lower elevator. We will be safe up to your... The control room isn't quite as safe as we'd hoped though, and before we can save him, he's thrown out the window. Rip. To make matters worse, the Gargantua is back and he's angry. I love this bit here when we make our escape. He just angrily tosses a shipping container at us. Even the aliens get a little personality in this mod. We find ourselves back in the parking lot and an employee who's barricaded himself in the control station demands that we find a security guard with the proper clearance to open the gates and escape. Damnation! Damnation! This situation has become unreasonable. You're going to have to locate a security guard before we leave this place. They're the only ones who know the codes we need. We don't have time for any foolishness. Get in there and find a guard. As expected, the military shows up to further complicate our plan, but we repair an elevator and descend into the lower levels of the building. Echoes, probably smartly, foregoes having a full, proper Zen sequence. Instead, it imagines Zen to be like the Zerg creep from StarCraft, spreading its alien flora and fauna and neon pink glow rapidly throughout the basement. This is also where we get some more explicit ties into the other games, with sightings of Adrian Shepard, Gordon Freeman, a Combine Advisor from Half-Life 2, and hey, wait, I've seen this guy before. Skibbity Toilet reference? So we help this HEV-suited goober of a security guard out of his elevator predicament. Good job! I wonder if those boys- Jeez, and I thought I had a long night. You look like hell. And track our way back upstairs, adding a cowardly scientist from the test labs to our adventuring party. Whoa! Who are you? I've been waiting here for ages, hoping someone would come along. When all the fighting started, I hid myself here. Having these two along with us opens a lot of doors, literally, and it's fun checking back in some areas that we couldn't access previously. Huh, what's this? Oh shit shit, sorry, I didn't know that would happen. Hey, you know what? Maybe we could catch a movie later. While this may be your idea of fun, I prefer long walks on a sandy beach as the sun sets. Ordering around followers in Half-Life 1 can be a bit janky, and that is still the case here, though sometimes it worked in the mod's favor. Our scientist buddy would frequently exclaim that he'd go no further, and I'd have to go back and grab him again. Yes. I'm not sure if this was a bug or done intentionally, but regardless, it does kind of add to his cowardly personality. Alright, a soldier. Now we're gonna see some action. This is as far as I go. Returning to the bossy, hard-hatted man, we gain entrance to the barricaded control room where he set up a makeshift shelter. This is another room just absolutely full of clever details. There's an HEV armor dispenser on the floor, being used as a way to power his little PC setup. In one corner, there's a bed made of cardboard with a cardboard pillow and a book and computer on either side. No need to get out of bed, just change what side you're laying on to swap between reading and gaming. The toilet is just absolutely obliterated, so he just started pissing in whatever this thing is. 
This man was trapped in here for a matter of hours and just made this horrible little goon cave. It's such creative and silly environmental storytelling, it's great. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, Boss Baby here has been pumped full of arrows and the military rolls in to do what they do. Our rival, the Gargantua, shows up and inadvertently saves us from sharing the fate of our recently deceased comrades. From this point on, we'll mostly be retreading our steps from the intro in reverse order. Even towards the end here, Echoes continually impresses me with its dedication to playing out the fate of nearly every person you encountered in the facility. My favorite example of this is the drunk guy we had to crouch jump up to in the opening minutes of the game. At some point, another scientist joined him up here and they barricaded themselves in with all the furniture they had available. They couldn't have anticipated the army showing up though, who only needed a ladder to reach them. Paying off this little story set up from an optional, slightly hard to reach area in such an understated and easy to miss way is just so cool. Echoes does this kind of thing from start to finish and it makes repeat playthroughs feel just as fresh as the first. Echoes closes out in a suitably bombastic fashion with a tastefully brief turret sequence all-out war outside with multiple tanks to take out, and a final confrontation with our gargantuan nemesis. The mod closes out with some pretty interesting story bits that I don't want to spoil here, but it should go without saying at this point that I highly recommend playing Echoes for yourself. It's only three hours long at most, and is absolutely bursting with charm and clever design. Easily one of the best mods made for Half-Life, and proof that this game and this engine still have plenty of enjoyable experiences left to provide. Speaking of which, I'd like to round the video out by talking about the exciting future of the game and its upcoming mods. One of the projects I'm personally most anticipating is Signal Lost. You don't see very many mods going this hard with customizing their mod DB page, so when it hit me with its wonderfully web 1.0 visuals and its Evangelion ass taglines here, I knew I was in for a treat. As is kind of implied with that image, Signal Lost is a reimagining of sorts of Half Life Uplink. Uplink was a demo for Half Life that was released a few months after the full game that, interestingly, contains levels and storyline that weren't present in the full release. Uplink is a pretty neat little time capsule, and as of the 25th anniversary update, you can easily play it from the start menu in the Steam version of Half-Life. Signal Loss can actually already be played in the form of a 40 minute or so demo. It utilizes Zash 3D and is completely standalone. No Half-Life necessary to download and play it. Despite the structural similarities to Uplink, Signal Loss has a unique vibe all of its own. From the changes to Gordon himself, now with a red HEV suit, contact lenses, and a more emo look to the environments with a Black Mesa facility that feels more in line with something like the UNATCO building from Deus Ex. Everything feels familiar, but different. As if you had reached into an alternate timeline and plucked out a remaster for a half-life that we never had. Contributing even further to this feeling is the inclusion of content that didn't make it beyond the alpha and beta stages of half-life's development. Enemies like the Minigun Grunt and the Panther Eye are resurrected from early builds of the game. Many enemy and friendly models are based on their early counterparts as well. Look at his big, beady eyes. The more stylized, cartoonish look of the human characters is really great. I also love that it defaults to unfiltered textures for a crunchy, pixelated look. It fits in well with the alpha version inspiration. Signal Lost is also probably the most visually impressive mod I've played for this video. The environments generally feel much darker and moodier than Half-Life, contrasting nicely with the colorful, vibrant lighting. Helicopters and jets fly by overhead, shaking the whole map, occasionally bombing nearby structures. The dust and debris floating around in brightly lit areas is a great touch, and the flashlight seems to cast light more naturally as well. I'm not sure how much of this, if any, is specifically made possible by using Zash 3D, but regardless, this thing is gorgeous. There's a general punching up of the darker elements of the game. 
There's a bit in the opening where a soldier gets dragged under a door and his leg breaks and sprays blood. Pretty brutal. Zombies have a lot more gory detail and they'll occasionally just explode when hit. It's pretty fun. Though they also walk like this, so I guess it balances out. Speaking of balance, there's an overall slowing down of the combat that I think suits the moodier aesthetics. Though the weapons from the base game return, switching between them takes a bit longer and they tend to have smaller magazine sizes, so reloading is a bit more frequent. This gives combat, especially early on, a more tense, calculated feel. I will say that if you plan to play this for yourself, and you absolutely should, I'd recommend playing it on at least the difficult difficulty. Unless this is like your absolute first FPS game ever, normal is just way too easy. Most areas are generously stocked with health and ammo, and that's without taking into account the enjoyable to find secret areas packed with even more supplies and power weapons. Signal Lost absolutely owns so far, and it's definitely the upcoming Half-Life mod that I'm most excited for. Is one I would have said, except that Jane Thrace, Signal Lost lead developer, is also making Starlight, which is some of the most my kind of shit I've seen in a while. This is just a truly wild visual approach for a Half-Life mod, like, look at and listen to this trailer. The beautiful pastel environments blasting off into edgy anime violence, this rules. Starlight isn't the only one pushing aesthetic boundaries in the modding space. Time Warp is another incredibly promising project with a standalone demo and a visual style that couldn't be further from Half-Life. Time Warp follows Jay and Patient84 as they travel through time and across the globe, featuring weapons and mechanics unique to each time period. Obvious Time Splitters vibes here, but the look actually reminds me more of Mega Man Legends, especially the characters. They're expressively animated, with cute details like how this guy here's mustache wiggles when he talks. It's got a fun Saturday morning anime sense of humor, and the voice acting is scrappy but endearing in that late 90s dub kind of way. From the future? Interesting. Shut up, Peters! This is another one of those freaks again! There's some neat effects here, too. I was pretty surprised to see this reflective floor. Not sure I've seen this kind of thing done in too many other mods so far. This simulated motion blur on the wall here is clever as well. Time Warp is not all style, though. It's a lot of fun to play. The weapons feel great, especially the basic pistol. There's only one location in the demo, but it's got a lot of variation and well-designed encounters. This one's pretty ambitious, but judging by the demo and recent screenshots and videos, I think it's gonna turn out great. Holy shit! Well into making this, Solitary Echoes, an Aliens-inspired mod, released a short demo and it's doing some pretty interesting things, like replacing the usual flashlight with these limited supply flares. Half-Life Year of the Dragon has a great demo too. Implementing Spyro the Dragon, complete with his full moveset, into a customized version of the office complex portion of the game. There's improved lighting and even working mirrors. It's pretty incredible. Ah, Spyro. It is jarring watching poor Spyro turn into giblets, though. Spyro, no! The truth is, this video could go on forever. Demos and trailers for new mods are coming out all the time. But this thing is pretty long as it is, so let's wrap up here. Ultimately, I hope, if nothing else, you can leave this video with the opinion that there is a value in preserving old mods and uplifting new ones. The 25th anniversary update, an overall great effort towards future-proofing the original Half-Life, did break basically every mod I have. And while it is easy enough to switch back and forth from the older version, I hope that Valve will continue to update the game to better support mods. There's just no question that Half-Life wouldn't be remembered the way that it is without the creativity and dedication of its fanbase. Whether through modified game engines like Zash, total conversions like Cry of Fear, large mods, small mods, maps, textures, models, music, sound, everything. All of it matters, and all of it makes Half-Life still great, even a quarter of a century later. Thanks for watching.